Please welcome moderator Alex Gibbons, President and CEO at the Center for Democracy and Technology, and distinguished panelist Congressman Jay Obernolte, Christina Montgomery of IBM, Leah Perry of Box, Nubia Shakuba of Adobe, and Nis Chuck Romine. Everybody set? Wonderful. Well, I am so happy to be here moderating this conversation on how to meet the AI moment. As we know, AI is top of mind for very many people. It is dominating news headlines. And I can't think of a better time to have a conversation around what responsible rules can look like uh, as we chart a path forward. And I'm going to just jump right into the conversation. And Congressman, I would love to start with you. In this moment, as you think about, from your perspective, you know, up on the hill, what responsible governance of AI should look like? How should the U.S. be moving forward as it thinks about potential rules of the road, particularly as other countries are moving forward in the regulatory space and in their own competitive advances as well? Well, it's something that I've given a lot of thought to. Uh, I think that, first of all, we need to recognize that this is something that requires regulation. And uh, we also have to be mindful about why we regulate. We don't regulate because we like big government and we think big government ought to control everything in the economy. We regulate to mitigate potential harms and to provide consumer protection. And that's something that I think is very clearly necessary when it comes to AI. I also think that we need to heed some of the lessons that we learned in digital data privacy where the U.S. was very slow to act. And in doing so, we opened the door for the states to become the laboratories of democracy and to enact like a patchwork of 50 different state regulations in response to that. And I was uh, actually the, one of the leads on the drafting of the California Consumer Privacy Act when I was in the legislature in California. So it's a topic that I know a lot about. But if you think about our constitutional duty as members of the federal government, I think it's very clear that this area is so obviously related to interstate commerce. It's something that belongs in the domain of federal government. Uh, and I think it's also very destructive to entrepreneurialism to allow this regulatory patchwork of 50 different state regulations to exist. So uh, that's where we're going with AI if the federal government doesn't step in. So I, I, that's why I think that, that regulation is going to be necessary. Yeah, I mean, and, and to your point, both California and Connecticut are amongst the states that are thinking about legislation in this space right now. What issues are top of mind that you would want to see tackled as we think about what responsible government looks like? What is the role for Congress in picking out kind of ways to respond to this moment? Well, uh, I mean, first of all, we're talking about digital data privacy uh, legislation. That, I think, is absolutely <laughs> priority one for us, because if you think about the harms that we want to mitigate when it comes to AI, uh, the, the number one harms in my mind right now in the early days of AI implementation are... AI's ab uncanny ability to pierce through digital data privacy and uh, re-aggregate disaggregated personal data and build behavioral models that are eerily accurate at predicting future human behavior. Uh, that's something that we know that AI is good at. Uh, we know that it can, it can be misused by malicious actors. So that's something that digital data privacy regulation will prevent now, and we're, we're very hopeful of getting that done in Congress this year. But in a larger sense, I think we need to do some deep thinking about what the harms are that we're trying to mitigate. You know, what's the worst thing that can happen with AI? And uh, as we all know in this room, uh, the, the worst things that can happen do not revolve around an army of evil robots rising up to take hmm. over the world, right? But there are equally consequential harms that, uh, that do worry the, the deep thinkers about AI. You know, harms uh, revolving around, uh, I mean, obviously economic disruption, you know, certainly something we need to be prepared for. Uh, but in a larger sense, the way that AI works, the way it's going to transform our economy, uh, it's going to shift the levers of economic power. And uh, one of the things that federal government is responsible for doing, you know, we know through the lesson of history, is to prevent the accumulation of monopolistic-like power in economic markets. And that, that's a very da a real danger with AI because training workable AI models require such a large set of training data, and very few companies have access to that. So it would be very easy for monopolistic-like conditions to develop in, in ex economic markets with respect to the access to AI. Now, so we need to do some thinking about what that means and how to prevent it. Wonderful. Panelists, I would love to turn to you. I have to scoot my chair so I can see you, so forgive me messing with the stage design here. There we go. Um, 
So I would love to hear kind of the take that you have from the various companies that you're in. And I'm going to tee up something that the congressman just said, which is I think it's really important in the AI conversations that we get specific about the types of harms we're worried about and trying to address. The congressman teed up some ways in which behavioral data, you know, data about people can be used to infer and predict behavior. We're seeing that now in AI decision-making tools that have a significant impact on people's access to economic opportunities or their civil rights or their civil liberties. And sometimes that conversation is a little bit different than generative AI, which may have other applications too. So I'm going to tee up the open question, the name of this panel, which is what strong and workable AI rules look to you? And as you answer, would love a little bit of specificity as to the types of harms you think Congress or policymakers in general need to be thinking about. Christina, let's start with you. Yeah, hi. So I um, completely agree with the sentiments that were just, uh, just expressed by the congressman in terms of uh, the need for regulation. Guardrails do make sense at this point in time, for sure. Um, but the role of policymakers I like to see is to create enabling frameworks for regulation. So first, essentially look at what existing regulations are out there in place today and then fill gaps with regulation that addresses the harms, many of which we talked about today in terms of bias and inclusion, preparing the workforce, hallucination and, and various spread of disinformation, cybersecurity and the like that we see could be real risks um, today. So uh, I also think it's uh, an opportunity for us to promote harmonization through standards bodies and the like um, so that we have uniformity because essentially what we're seeing happening in the privacy space would be completely unworkable, agree with that completely, um, in terms of AI. We can't have 50 states regulating it differently. We can't have countries and governments around the world regulating different, differently. So I think the need for harmonization is really critical, too. Wonderful. Leah? Thank you. Um, I completely agree with you. I, I definitely think that there needs to be a noted focus on carrying the laws that are already available, particularly outside of just the laws, but OECD principles, the AI risk management framework, and figuring out where we're missing the pieces in terms of where the law currently stands. Um, the high-risk use cases, obviously, are, are things or consequential decision-making are things that really I'm concerned about. And I think you know, so many others are also concerned about, too, whether or not you're talking about surveillance, whether or not you're talking about deep, deep fakes or facial recognition where there's no transparency or explainability around AI. I think that clearly those are areas where we want to ensure that there is a level of not only testing when it comes to modeling and training, but even further so, making sure that uh, we're being clear and transparent about what we're doing and making sure that we're not removing the human from the actual decision-making process that could impact an individual's ability to be employed, healthcare benefits, et cetera. That's great. Maybe. I concur with all of my fellow panelists. I have to make you disagree at one point. Uh, I mean, by the know, end of this panel, we'll find something. <laughs> um, I would say that the three kind of concepts to keep in mind that we try to focus on at Adobe um, is really responsibility, accountability, and transparency. And so the responsibility to uh, address the testing and remediation of the tools and the uh, forms that are being built, as well as accountability related to remediating any unexpected bias. The transparency when it comes to AI is not at all just what it was in privacy with the individual, but the interoperability and just the large-scale processing of the deep fakes. Can society at large trust, and is it transparent, what is actually happening in the AI? And so from content authenticity to the content credentials allowing creators to be able to tag their name, the tool that was used, the date that was created. I'm sure everyone in this room um, can recognize the cat driving the car, maybe that didn't happen. But obviously the politicians and all of um, the celebrities and many of the deep fakes out, of, out there does require special attention. And so drawing our eyes towards how we can really re remediate some of this misinformation, um, I definitely agree is also key. 
That's great. Dr. Rumi, we'd lo love to turn to you. So NIST, when they released the AI risk management framework, was you know, congressionally mandated to do so. So thank you, Congress, for getting this conversation going well. Um, and NIST carried it forward through a long-time consensus process to come out with a framework for companies to use as they think about risks. It's not mandatory. NIST is always very careful to, to assert that. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious the role that you think from NIST that the AI RMF can have in society and how it fits into this uh, landscape for AI governance. Sure. I want to... I want to take the opportunity to say that the, the advances in AI, which have been so dramatic, are in many ways an exciting amplification of human capabilities. And there's a lot of good that can come from that. But of course, a big problem is uh, managing the risks associated with that. When you amplify human capabilities this dramatically, it also amplifies the potential for humans or uh, other other harms, humans to, to use AI to cause harm or other harms to, to take place. Um, the AI risk management framework, which we were privileged to lead, uh, thanks to Congress for uh, providing us that opportunity, um, the way that we do that is engaging with the private sector uh, and other government agencies. I'm sure that all of my colleagues to the right have participated in the AI uh, risk management framework development process. Um, it's, a, it's a terrific way to take a look at a framework that can uh, guide those kinds of guardrails that we were just talking about, this idea of understanding the risks uh, to, in some cases, the risk to human dignity, to privacy. Uh, we, we want uh, AI technologies that preserve those things. But we also want, um, when we talk about regulation, for example, uh, one of the questions that sort of is begged is regulations to what standard? What is it that we're going to hold people accountable for? When we talk about fairness, when we talk about um, transparency, those are fantastic. How are we going to evaluate those? And so that's one of the things that the risk management framework does and the conversations that we're having with industry is trying to identify a common lexicon, a common understanding of what those terms mean and how we can undertake those evaluations. One of the themes that emerged from some of your answers was this notion of looking to see how existing laws already map onto these frameworks and trying to you know, use that as one mechanism and then seeing where the gaps are. I will say as a civil society advocate, one of the things that we focus on is it actually can sometimes be really hard to detect those harms to tell whether existing laws even apply. You know, one easy example is the use of AI in hiring systems, for example. We have strong employment discrimination laws on the books. But right now, I could be a job applicant, or I could even be a regulator at the EEOC trying to put together a case, and have no idea of a tool's even being used in the first place. So I'm curious when we think about a governance framework, kind of how we can connect existing laws, but try and make them actually map onto this technology more effectively to actually make those tools useful in the first place. I'm curious if, if anybody wants to jump on that piece of this. So I'll just say, I think transparency is really critical. And so advocating for um, when AI is being used should be first and foremost, like especially in the context of consequential decisions like employment decisions and the like, should always know when AI is being used and deployed. And then just basic um, information on AI models in terms of fact sheets, model cards, what data was it trained on, uh, you know, uh, what's the, the performance evaluation of an AI model in terms of how accurate it is, and the like. Um, and certainly bias testing and, cons and consequential decisions and the like should be part and parcel of deploying AI. I also think it's important to be mindful uh, about the fact that the, the quality escapes that we've had that you brought up, uh, where AI has turned out to be discriminatory so far. And you mentioned one of them, which was in uh, the uh, automated screening of resumes. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, the highly publicized uh, example of facial recognition. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that turned out to be discriminatory as well, but n none of those have been intentional. Uh, it's been a function of a lack of forethought about the way the models were trained and the way that they might be used. Uh, the reason why that's important is that we already have laws prohibiting discrimination. So when we talk about whether or not more laws are necessary, you know, that's not a case where laws are necessary because anyone that used AI to intentionally discriminate in a domain such as hiring 
would already be in violation of the law, regardless of whether or not they used AI to do it or some other technique. So uh, I, I think that's an important distinction to make. Yeah, one of the things that's pointed to in this space is the auditing and impact assessments could be one way to help, right? If you mandate transparency around a tool being used and mandate that audits happen, um, that would do a better job of helping identify when those risks are occurring, help companies hopefully mitigate them ahead of time, and if they're not doing it, allow advocates or regulators to come in. But there's a big conversation around what meaningful auditing actually looks like in the first place, right? Who should it be done by? Should it be inside the company or outside of the company? What level of disclosure is required? I could go down a whole rabbit hole as we try to, try, try to think about this. But I would love to have the panelists take on it. And Nubia, perhaps start with you in terms of when you think about meaningful auditing and meaningful impact assessments, what does that look like to you? Thank you. I, I, I would say that we need to maintain some level of flexibility without being so prescriptive. Must it be internal? Must it be external? Provided we have a framework that requires you to have some initial um, impact assessment and ongoing auditing and monitoring, this is not a stale, one-and-done way to have an assessment. It is constant and continuous monitoring and feedback and learning from what was done and did not work well with the appropriate review board of diverse individuals of thought and ethnicity and gender um, and other diversity components to make sure you're taking into account all of the various subject matter areas and ethics areas. And so those impact assessments we should learn from and build upon. I also would say that the concept of making sure you have the right cross-functional group in the room to make sure those assessments take into account the holistic nature of all the various impacts is also really key. Um, I would not prescribe for any um, specific requirements unless you're going to have a risk-based framework that allows the scope and nature not only of the risk harm of the tool, but also the company and the size so that it can scale for each specific company's different allowance and what they're able to accomplish, not making it too big or too small. I would say also just lastly on check the box, if your culture is a check the box culture, um, you would have an AI culture with the privacy impact assessments that's checked the box. If you come from a, a company that believes in trust and doing things the right way, AI is going to be extension of the impact assessments and audits you already have in the privacy and other spaces. And so really important to build on that culture because this area in AI is much harder to assess and so really just expanded issues if you get it wrong. You know, just going a step further, I, I completely agree with you, but I, I think also you have to recognize it isn't a one-size-fits-all scenario when it comes to testing on your model, et cetera. And this gets to the larger picture of overall AI governance and how does that look like within your respective company. I, I certainly think that your testing and training should be based on what the intended use is. So if the intended use is more high risk, which would contribute to consequential decision making, et cetera, your training and modeling may be a lot more different, if you will, than what it would be in terms of AI that simply you know, uh, is trying to organize files and folders, right? Uh, and then even further, I, I do just have to flag in terms of the role of regulators in all of this. Um, I know that there's open discussions and ongoing sandboxing, for instance, happening over in the EU and decisions around whether or not uh, DPAs should certify um, on certain modeling and training. And it does make you question who is certifying, right? And making sure that those individuals that are actually certifying have that expertise needed in order to do so. So again, not one size fits all, but also making sure that the experts are there that are doing that testing, training, et cetera. Dr. Maureen, I know that NIST has published a roadmap for what the plans are in the AI space after the release of the risk management framework. And one of them is around measurement um, standards, conversations that NIST is participating in. Can you speak a little bit to this? Does NIST have a role in helping develop what meaningful audits or impact assessments looks like, and, and how will that unfold in the coming months and years? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think our one of, one of the key elements, I think, in any kind of uh, program that involves auditing or assessing 
is, uh, is this idea of testing, evaluation, uh, verification, and validation, right, this TEVV uh, arena. And we've talked a lot about that in our, uh, in our risk management framework and the, and the, uh, and the associated documents. The, the importance of doing that kind of work. And I appreciate the congressman bringing up uh, face recognition as one element because uh, NIST has been involved in biometrics research since 1963, and among the areas that we've looked at very carefully is face recognition. We've done a lot of testing and evaluation in that space to understand both the capabilities of those systems and the limitations, and in particular, the differences among the different algorithms. So one of the things that we have to understand is uh, the, the capabilities of AI in general are not going to be uniform. They're going to be very different for different uh, purposes. And some of the things that we're going to have to do involve an assessment uh, vertically in each use case. How, how is the AI system being used for the specific purpose? Uh, and what are, the, what are the risks associated there? Christina, I would love to bring you in, and Congressman, you might want to chime in on this as well. One of the things that's complicated about AI is that it's a pretty distributed value chain, right? You have the developers of an AI system, you have the deployers, typically companies that are using it, you have either the end users who may then be, be using it in a real-world application, or the subjects of the decision. Um, and each of those people have something that they contribute to the tool and how it's being used and how it's interacting with a particular uh, set of data and set of facts. I'm curious, when you think about regulation or even companies choosing to do their own auditing, where do you put the responsibility in the value chain? Should it just be on the developers? Should it be on the deployers? Is it everybody? How do we think about that role of responsibility and how um, kind of attenuated it sometimes can be? Yeah, as you said, it's complicated because the life cycle has so many different players and there isn't just a single go-to-market model <coughs> for AI. Um, so when you think about something like foundation models, um, the benefit of a foundation model is you can train it once and then it can be adapted to a wide range of downstream uses. They may be very, very different. Um, so for example, a large language model can be deployed in a banking application, it can be deployed in a healthcare application, in retail and the like. Um, and when it, it's essentially the uh, deployer that is taking that base model and adding and training and refining and tuning it for their end application with their data. And if you introduce a developer into that construct by saying the developer's responsible in the end for the banking application as it's deployed in context, you're introducing risk because you're going to, by definition, be requiring a developer to have access, knowledge that it doesn't have today to data and information that presents privacy risks, for example, to very domain-specific use cases where it's not the right party to really understand the implications because AI should be regulated in its context and use. And high-risk application should have more regulation than low-risk application. Well, it's the deployer that understands that environment best, right? So that's not to say there shouldn't be any obligations on developers. I think what you see in the EU AI Act, the original construct of it, was the market's gonna play this out, right? Because if you put an obligation on a de deployer, they're going to need information from developers in order to meet their regulatory obligations. And that will play out in contracts, that will play out in uh, the type of deliverables that come with foundation models, and I'm using that because it's a pretty you know, common thing we're talking about a lot today. So in terms of then requiring developers to deliver something with the data and with the model, like a fact sheet or a model card that says, here's the data I trained it on, here's how it performed, um, just all the facts in terms of that, so that the deployer can then use that um, to meet and fulfill their obligations. So that's the model that I think will work best in this construct. Um, and I think also back to this point of standard, standardization and harmonization, like standardizing what that looks like. What, what do we think should do, a, fact, a fact sheet or a model card, what should be the data that's in there? Standardizing on that, you know, harmonizing regulations around that, I think would also be a, a good direction for us to go. One question before I bring in the congressman. In that 
kind of the framework that you just set out, it makes a lot of sense when the deployer is a sophisticated entity with bargaining power mm -hmm. that can push back on the developer and mandate that their things be kind of a result of the contract, presuming it's a contract-based model. But that's not always the case, right? And I don't think that's really the future vision of AI. Many people talk about it as having far wider distributed uses than that. And Congressman, you've been you know, a real thought leader talking about how to have competition in this future market and how to make sure the benefits of these tools work for everyone. So I'm curious in a space where developers might not be that sophisticated, it is somebody deciding whether to use, you know, an off-the-shelf hiring tool just to stick with that same example. You can put it in other fact patterns. Do we need some flexibility in how we think about this depending on what the circumstances are? Do you think there are moments where developers really should be on the hook because they're the ones that were doing that foundational work? Again, I think you have to have this risk-reward ba risk balance. What is technically feasible coming from a developer? And do you impose requirements you know, at that development stage that require transparency, that require some amount of facts? Um, then I think that's wise. But what you're expecting necessarily from a developer at that end stage will make them an insurance company, <laughs> right? Uh, so, I, you know, I, I, I don't... I think there needs to be a risk benefit reward, and then maybe in some cases, you know, uh, things don't get deployed. I mean, so the deployer should have obligations to say, I don't trust this model, or I'm not going to, you know, use it as part of the foundation of what I'm deploying and putting onto the marketplace. That we should hold small, which is why the rules need to be flexible, um, and they need to address small businesses as well as large businesses and the like. Congressman, would love your thoughts on this. You know, it's interesting, uh, because we live in a democracy, and democracy is messy, we have to be very careful about this. Uh, we would be foolish when making judgments about value not to use the technology that we already have that's proven to be the greatest judge of value in the history of human civilization, and that's free markets. Free markets do a great job of tunneling down on what people find value in and what adds value to transactions. So I think that we need to harness that power when judging the value of AI. Uh, it would be pretty Orwellian to create and empower a government bureaucracy to be the arbiters of what good AI is and what bad AI is. You know, can you imagine you know, someone sitting in a chair, oh, good, 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 oh, no, that's bad. Not allowed to do that, good, bad. Uh, you, you know, that, that would get unreasonably messy. And let me give you an example, and this is a real world example because this is a purpose and a use to which AI is being put right now, is the detection of nascent tumors in CT scans. Uh, so uh, the, the FDA is considering approval of these AI algorithms that can do automated reading of CT scans to detect not only the malady that caused the symptoms that led to the scan, but also tumors that the uh, patient might not even be aware of. So. Uh, if this works, and it's looking like it will, uh, it's a huge win for almost everyone, right? It's a win for the patient, hands down. They get their scans read faster, cheaper, and they have a new capability of detecting these tumors sooner, which allows much better treatment outcomes for them. Uh, great win for insurance companies because it drives down the health of uh, cost of health care because not only the scans are cheaper, but, uh, but uh, you got these cancers that are much uh, more, less expensive to treat. Uh, who doesn't win? Well, radiologists don't win because you need fewer of them, and what a radiologist does is different. So because we live in a democracy, the radiologists get together and they petition the FDA or whatever bureaucracy we empower with regulation of AI, and they say, no, you can't allow this, you see, and they, they come up, oh, consumer safety, you see, you need a, a human in the loop, or they make an economic argument, protect our jobs, you know, which is a very powerful emotional one. So uh, this is why we have to be so careful, because, I mean, no one can deny in that particular use case that the most beneficial uh, thing for us societally is to allow that use of AI as long as it's reading the scans ac more accurately than a human radiologist would, which is the only standard that matters. You know, and yet, we're going to have political forces arrayed to prevent that use from occurring. And that's just like one example. There's going to be a million a hundred million examples just like that, and that's what we have to prepare for. So 
one could argue back, and I'm not going to take on that example because I think that's actually a very good one for, for your perspective. Right, let's, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's um, but one of the one of the arguments people would make is that regulation does help to address places of market failure. So where, for example, people can't even get the information they need to make an informed decision in the market, regulation might be able to step in and help with that. Um, and so here's kind of my question: If we're thinking about deployers who literally are trying to make an informed choice, hey, may, can I use this tool or not? Is this going to get me in trouble with the law or not? How are they going to be able to get that information from developers you know, without some type of regulation around transparency, risk management processes that developers need to put out into the ecosystem as well? Sure. Uh, I think it's a, it's a fair question. Uh, and I think that you need to distinguish between a uh, developer of AI and a developer of the risk management framework that you're talking about. And I think those two entities probably are not the same. Mm. You know, and I think if you want to be a responsible deployer, that you have an obligation to consider both of those. You know, you, you pick AI that you want to use, but you also pick people that will help you determine what those uh, consequences can be. And I think from a governmental standpoint, uh, we have a similar obligation. I think you put it very well. You know, the, the job of a regulator is not to pick winners and losers, because we've found to our misfortune that that's a very destructive thing to have government do. Uh, the job of regulators is to minimize what economists call externalities. You know, it's the classic case of why big rigs are required to have mud flaps. Mud flaps do nothing for the big rig, but it prevents the water from going on the windshield of the car behind the big rig. So you're imposing cost on the operator of the big rig to protect the car behind them, right? This is what we need to, you know, those kinds of externalities are what we need to, uh, to consider when we're regulating AI. But, you know, the North Star for us always, always, always has to be uh, consumer well-being. You know, what will advance us as a society and, and define however you want to, you know, average human condition. Uh, you know, what, what will advance us and what sets us back? Would anyone else like to chime in on this? And I'm going to take us on a subject matter pivot. All right, we have gone a full 30 minutes without saying the words chat GPT. I think that might merit a round of applause for an AI panel, but we should be talking about generative AI as well. We've, we've obviously been talking about it in these answers, but I want to take it on pretty explicitly too, which is to say, for many of us that work in this space, you know, AI hasn't just been the news cycle for the past three months. Many smart people have been working on this for a very long time from a policy perspective. But I'm curious how people's thinking about the governance of AI changes now that generative AI is so much part of the public conversation and being deployed so much more widely than it was, you know, even six months ago, a year ago. Um, Christina, maybe I start with you. You know, what is, what is your take on this? You know, does generative AI really change the nature of the conversation, and if so, how? Yeah, I mean, I think what it's essentially done is democratize the discussion and the availability of tools like ChatGPT for people to play with and explore and see the strengths, but also the weaknesses of something like, you know, an open domain chatbot. So a lot of the risks that we're seeing as a result of these models, we're talking about for the first time maybe as a global community, but they're not new risks. Um, many of them related to bias, related to personal information. They may be scaled by open domain technologies, certainly. Um, but they're not new risks. The new risks are things like, you know, um, hallucination, hallucination and, and the potential for misinformation uh, to be deployed on a grand scale, right? So I think it's important for us to kind of take a breather as we see these new technologies. I do think that it is very, been very helpful to uh, light a fire under the conversation and also for people to see the strengths and the weaknesses. Um, and so we know now, well, we can't necessarily rely on the output of something because it may not be accurate. So there are weaknesses there. It's not magic, right? We are understanding a little bit more about it being a prediction tool and algorithm. So take a breath, assess the emerging risks. Glad to see there's more conversation now because we as a company for example, yeah, have been calling for regulation in the space of AI for a number of years now. I finally feel like we're getting some traction around those conversations as a result of it. But then, you know, let's focus on what we need to do now um, to put guardrails in place that are flexible, that are addressing the risk that's been around for AI, you know, with respect to AI, um, and doing it in a risk and context-based way. Leah, I would love your take. 
Yeah, sure. I, I, I definitely think that it advances the conversation. For Box, we serve uh, over 115,000 business enterprises, which includes about 75% of Fortune 500 companies. And so Box is the content cloud for many various multinational customers and recently launched uh, the Box AI product offering. And the feedback we received prior to launch and just evaluating where customers were at, people were thrilled about the aspect of integrating, whether it's open AI or another generative AI technology into our product offering and to be able to leverage that knowledge, whether or not it's building out and better organizing their unstructured data, including uh, classification of that data, how it's used, handled, et cetera, and marrying these various pieces together. So it creates better efficiency, effectiveness, for uh, end users and specifically the business enterprises that leverage Box. On the flip side, uh, the challenge uh, in terms of when you look at generative AI is the fact alone that it mimics human behavior. You know, and in that mimicking, the end user being comfortable taking the human element out in terms of making that high risk decision. And so just going back to the earlier discussion that you were having, um, I think it's critical that transparency and explainability is there and that you're very clear about the product offering to which you're either integrating with, developing, what the <clears throat> what the intended use is. If you're not clear about the intended use, or even going a step further, prohibited uses, then when the when it's ultimately applied and the end user is applying that technology, they have no clear guardrails either, because you haven't been clear on your end about the product offering to which you're putting in the marketplace. Nubia, this ties up a, tees up a perfect question I was going to ask you, which is we're having a lot of conversation around legislation and policy solutions, but I've been watching a lot of these news stories unfold and wondering how much litigation is actually going to tackle generative AI before policymakers have even finished you know, their early conversations about it. We've already seen lawsuits grounded in copyright, grounded in privacy. Leah tees up good examples where people might rely on a chat result that could lead to product liability or some type of negligence claims. I'm curious how you think about this. Are the courts going to be tackling this before the regulators even come along? Uh, I'm not a betting person, but I'm willing to put <laughs> all of my money on black. <laughs> yes. Right. Just like the congressman said, we live in a democracy, and along with all of that great value created is a litigious society, and uh, definitely the lawsuits will continue. It is while we wait for legislation in this complicated manner, if you just think back to GDPR, right, initially proposed in 2012, passed in 2016, effective in 2018, that was six years. So the EU AI Act, um, we expect to be passed in full according to the estimates by end of year, but technology is moving at warp breakneck speed and cannot keep up. And so we're relying on all of these foundational principles outside of AI that are so integrated like privacy and copyright. And so people will try to, um, as there's just confusion, try to un test the bounds of what is allowed and not in court cases for sure. That will absolutely continue. When you talk about asking AI certain questions and you rely on it and negligence, I personally would not ask AI anything that I did not know the answer to, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it is hard at this point as we're in the early training stages in that iterative model to be able to fix it. You have to know what's right and wrong. And so we're nowhere close to where we need to be. And so expect the lawsuits to continue. Would others like to weigh in on that? Does Congress sit with popcorn as the defamation suits <laughs> take root? <laughs> no, you know, uh, uh, frankly, the, uh, the empowerment of litigious law firms with profit motives uh, is something actually I think we have an obligation to guard against as well as empowering, right? But, uh, you know, I, I, let me just be a little contrary and uh, insert a note of optimism about 
the generative use of AIs, because I think a lot of people are talking about the, the dystopian you know, future view of, wow, you see something, you don't know if it's real or fake. Right? But this is a, something we've been grappling with now for years. Mm -hmm. right? uh, if you showed a scene from a Marvel movie to someone 50 years ago, they would look at that and say, that looks real. Right? So this is something that is coming regardless of whether or not AI is in the mix. But I'm maybe hopeful that rather than you know, this dystopian view of, a uh, pessimistic view of, uh, well, people are not, not going to know what's fake or real, and, uh, you know, the spread of disinformation, and, you know, this disinformation will be everywhere, and uh, you know, think about it, think about the optimistic point of view, which is maybe this will finally catalyze a change in people's awareness of the need to verify data that they're looking at. You know, maybe the emphasis will be on the consumer, where, you know, instead of looking at, you know, a video of Jay Obernolte beating his wife on the Internet, right, because someone used generative AI to make it, you know, maybe you see that and you say, well, would he really do that? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little skeptical that that's real. And, you know, that's what we're missing, you know, that last, that last link there, that skepticism. And we need that skepticism regardless of whether or not generative AI exists. I couldn't agree with you more. How do we get there, though? It doesn't seem that evolution in human thinking doesn't seem to be getting there just yet. I disagree with you. You know, I, I think if you look at uh, Gen Z and the millennials, you know, they are the first generation that has been bombarded from birth with marketing. Mm. And they are much more skeptical than we are, than, 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 than my generation, the generations before us. Uh, you know, they have that skepticism because they've had to have it. You know, they, when someone gives them a message, they've been obligated to say, wow, is that really true? Or are they just saying that to make a dollar, right? So, I mean, I, I think that we're getting there. But, I mean, also, uh, I think that we can help. So one of the ways we can help, uh, people talk a lot about generative AI and uh, watermarking is one of the, the, the uh, technologies that has proposed, been proposed to, uh, to deal with this. Like, okay, if this is fake, and we're gonna make, it's been generated by, uh, by AI, it's a video sequence, we're gonna require the AI to watermark it so everyone knows it's been generated. Well, to me, that's incredibly naive because if someone puts a video of Jay Obernolte beating his wife on the internet with malicious intent, they're not gonna watermark it, right? So maybe instead, we watermark the stuff that is real like security camera footage. Maybe there's an encryption algorithm that, that, that can watermark each frame in a way that links them together with a blockchain uh, that, that says, okay, this is a piece of data that we can verify came from that security camera uh, and therefore is admissible in court you know, and, and provable. Right? Maybe, maybe that's the way we solve you know, that, that part of the problem. Maybe I know that this is something Adobe's, this is not a product placement. I just happen to know that Adobe's been thinking I, I a lot about this. I agree with you more. <laughs> <laughs> this so is not choreographed. In 2019, <laughs> Adobe had a content authenticity initiative with over 900 companies, companies who have signed up, where we do just that. Those content credentials that attach to a video and a picture that says, we can't tell you what's fake. But here is the timeline and the blockchain of what is real. Here's who created it. Here's everything that's been done to it. And so the criminals are not going to go through and be part of that. But yes, the skepticism that says, if you don't see this, you should not trust that it is real. We 100% agree that the future we are, believe is bright. And to counteract this misinformation is to really have this content authenticity and change our entire mindset. We strongly believe that. And I'll say another thing I think that in civil society we're talking a lot about is how to have officials and people that do have authoritative information become more trusted voices. So we spend time training election officials, for example, to make sure they're using a .gov website, not a .com. Use those signifiers to show that you're authentic. How are you getting out ahead of the messaging curve so that you can be putting out good information about where people can vote, the timing of polls, et cetera, and try to counter. Um, but I think a lot of cross-society work to be done. Dr. Amin, I'd love to come back to you because, um, so NIST published the risk management profile and then the generative AI news wave hit almost exactly after it launched. And so I know that you all are getting hit with a lot of questions as to how well the risk management framework maps over to generative AI, if there's more work NIST is going to be doing in this space. What are you thinking? So the answer to both of those is yes. <laughs> uh, it maps well and there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, I think, you know, generative AI over the last few months has sort of caught everyone by surprise by the acceleration of uh, the capabilities far beyond what anyone had originally predicted. 
And of course, that, again, as I said before, accelerates the, uh, the potential ills as well. But I appreciate uh, the congressman's emphasis on sort of a, uh, an optimistic view. We're, we're really talking about a capability now that's going to influence in very positive ways medicine, as he talked about, but also energy, transportation, logistics. You know, virtually every field of endeavor is going to be uh, enhanced in some ways through these technologies. Uh, the question is how we manage the associated risks uh, inherent in these as well. And I think, uh, again, the congressman, or I think it was one of the other panelists, talked about the importance of context of use. And I think that's a really key driver here. Um, one of the problems, one of the challenges faced by policymakers and, and regulators is a broad brushstroke regulation is going to be very difficult to keep current, as was talked about earlier, and also address the specific ills within a particular uh, segment of the, of the economy. So uh, there's a lot more work to be done in this. Congressman, there are reporters in the room, so I said I had to make news today. I'm going to try and get you to forecast. You already mentioned um, federal privacy legislation. Wonderful. Many of us have been calling for that for a long time. But I'm curious about AI-specific legislation and trying to get a little bit more clear on what you think the next steps for Congress will be. Senator Schumer has talked about wanting to move in this space. Within the federal privacy bill, there are provisions for algorithmic impact assessments that I think a lot of us think are a good first step. There's the Algorithmic Accountability Act, you know, various legislative proposals out there now. I'm curious, will you prognosticate for us? Is Congress going to act on AI, and if so, when? Uh, so I would say, uh, prognostication hat on, <laughs> uh, I would say, you know, step one, as you say, is enacting comprehensive federal data privacy standards. And I am cautiously optimistic we will get that done this year, hopefully this summer. Uh, as you know, that's something that the Energy and Commerce Committee has been working very diligently on for the last couple of years. And that's step one, because a lot of the near-term harms that AI can uh, be used to create revolve around the use of personal data. So, uh, you know, that, that's really going to give us a little bit of runway on the rest of uh, AI regulation. Uh, past that, I would say, uh, it, it, I think it's, it's going to be very necessary to be thoughtful about about what we want to do with AI. And, and uh, you know, as mentioned, the EU framework, which I think is a, a good example of uh, the, putting the cart ahead of the horse. Because essentially what the EU is saying is, if you want to develop AI, uh, you have to apply for a governmental license, and we're going to spin up this whole new bureaucracy and empower them to decide what AI is good and what AI is bad. Problem solved. Done, moving on, right? And I think that that's you know, a really kind of simplistic and naive way of looking at it because not only are you, it's, it's corrosive to a democracy because you're empowering an unelected bureaucracy to make what are going to be really important decisions about this value judgment about AI, uh, but also you're not saying anything about why you're regulating. You're not saying anything about the harms that you're trying to prevent. And I think those are the things that we have to be mindful of. So it's going to be very interesting to see what the EU does uh, and then to maybe, you know, take a look at, at what our approach is going to be. And uh, we, were, we were having a discussion, actually, uh, just before we came here on stage about maybe an alternative approach, which is something that, that I've done a lot of thinking about. You know, maybe instead of trying to focus on uh, the algorithms of AI, maybe we focus on precursors. Maybe uh, like the same problem that we had with the regulation of methamphetamines. Meth, meth is really easy to make if you have knowledge of chemistry. Uh, the precursors to meth are not easy to make. So instead of trying to regulate meth, you can you know, make a law against meth, but the bad actors are just going to ignore it. Uh, instead, you focus on the precursors like pseudofedrin, which are much harder to make, and make sure you understand who has the pseudofedrin and where it's going. So we could do the same thing with AI. Uh, one of the necessary components to AI is compute power. So, uh, and it turns out that the scale of compute power that's used to train an algorithm like ChatGPT is something that very few companies actually have a legitimate use for uh, outside of AI. So if we understand, and, and like Sufedrin, it's very hard and expensive to put together this compute power. You don't just go down to Best Buy and you know, buy a PC and plug it in. So if we uh, enacted, like as a first step, for example, some legislation to require a know your customer rules like we do in banking to make sure that we understand who has accumulated this compute power, the uses to which it's being put? You know, I think that would help maybe help us understand the landscape of what we need to regulate. So uh, there might be some, uh, some, uh, some efforts that, uh, at, at walking before we run, we're running, is, is what I'm saying. But uh, I think that happens after digital privacy legislation this year.
Fascinating. Reporters, take note. Well, with that, please join me in thanking this wonderful panel.